section five of the glories of ireland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Irish Love of Learning by Rev. P. S. Deneen, M. A. R. U. I. The distinguishing property of man, says Cicero is to search for and follow after truth therefore when disengaged from our necessary cares and concerns we desire to see to hear and to learn and we esteem knowledge of things obscure or wonderful as indispensable to our happiness de officius one four i claim for the irish race that throughout their history they have cut down their bodily necessities to the quick in order to devote time and energy to the pursuit of knowledge that they have engaged in intellectual pursuits not infrequently of a high order on a low basis of material comfort that they have persevered in the quest of learning under unparalleled hardships and difficulties even in the dark night of a nation's eclipse when a school was an unlawful assembly and school teaching a crime i claim moreover that when circumstances were favourable no people have shown a more adventurous spirit or a more chivalrous devotion in the advancement and spread of learning love of learning implies more than a natural aptitude for acquiring information it connotes a zest for knowledge that is recondite and attainable only at the expense of ease of leisure of the comforts and luxuries of life and a zeal for the cultivation of the mental faculties it is of the soul and not of the body it refines elevates adorns it is allied to sensibility to keenness of vision to the close observation of mental phenomena its possessor becomes a citizen of the known world his mind broadens he compares contrasts conciliates he brings together the new and the old the near and the distant the permanent and the transitory and weaves from them all the web of systematized human thought i am not here concerned with the extent of ireland's contribution to the sum of human learning nor with the career of her greatest scholars i am merely describing the love of learning which is characteristic of the race and which it seems best to present in a brief study of distinct types drawn from various periods of irish history in the pre-christian period the druid was the chief representative of the learning of the race he was the adviser of kings and princes and the instructor of their children his knowledge was of the recondite order and beyond the reach of ordinary persons the esteem in which he was held by all classes of the people proves their love for the learning for which he stood patrick came and with him came a wider horizon of learning and greater facilities for the acquisition and diffusion of knowledge monastic schools sprang up in all directions at clonard armagh clonmanoy bangor lismore kildare innisfallen these schools were celebrated throughout europe in the earlier middle ages and from the fifth to the ninth century ireland led the nations of europe in learning and deserved the title of the island of saints and scholars our type is the student in one of these monastic schools he goes out from his parents and settles down to study in the environs of the monastery he is not rich he resides in a hut his time is divided between study prayer and manual labour he becomes a monk 
only to increase in devotion to learning and to accentuate his privations he copies and illuminates manuscripts he memorizes the psalms he glosses the vulgate scriptures with vernacular notes he receives ordination and realizing that there are benighted countries ten times as large as his native land beyond the seas and burning with zeal for the spread of the gospel and the advancement of learning sails for britain or passes into gaul or reaches the slopes of the apennines or the outskirts of the black forest the rest of his life is devoted to the foundation of monasteries to which schools are attached to the building of churches and to the diffusion around him of every known branch of knowledge he may have taken books from ireland overseas and of these relics are now to be found among the treasures of the ancient libraries of europe columcill columbanus adamnan gaul virgilius occur to the mind in dwelling on this type the hereditary shanchade who treasured up the traditional lore of the clan and its chief was held in high honour and enjoyed extraordinary privileges he held a freehold he was high in the graces of the chief and officiated at his inauguration an important type is the irish ecclesiastical student abroad in the penal days school teaching unless at the sacrifice of faith was a crime in ireland and the training required for the priesthood had to be obtained on the continent the irish out of their poverty established colleges in rome sixteen twenty eight salamanca fifteen ninety three seville sixteen twelve alcala fifteen ninety lisbon fifteen ninety three louvain sixteen thirty four antwerp sixteen twenty nine douai fifteen seventy seven lille sixteen ten bordeaux sixteen o three toulouse sixteen fifty nine paris sixteen o five and elsewhere as late as seventeen ninety five these colleges contained four hundred seventy eight students and some of them are still in existence the young student in going abroad risked everything he often returned watched by spies with his life in danger yet the supply never failed the colleges flourished and those who returned diffused around them not only learning but the urbanity and refinement which were a striking fruit and mark of their studies abroad another type is the irish scribe in the days of ireland's fame and prosperity and of the flood tide of her native language he was a skilled craftsman and the extant specimens of his work are unsurpassed of their kind but i prefer to look at him at a later period when he became our sole substitute for the printer and when his diligence preserved for us all that remains of a fading literature he was miserably poor he toiled through the day at the spade or the plough or guided the shuttle through the loom at night by the flare of the turf fire or the fitful light of a splinter of bogwood he made his copy of poem or tract or tale which but for him would have perished the copies are often ill-spelt and ill-written but with all their faults they are as noble a monument to national love of learning as any nation can boast of in our gallery of types we must not forget the character whom english writers contemptuously call the hedge schoolmaster the hedge school in its most elemental state was an open-air daily assemblage of youths in pursuit of knowledge inasmuch as the law had refused learning a fitting temple in which to abide and be honoured 
she was led by her votaries into the open and there beside the fragrant hedge if you will with the green sward for benches and the canopy of heaven for dome she was honoured in ireland even as she had been honoured ages before in greece in palestine and by our primordial celtic ancestors themselves the hedge schoolmaster conducted the rites and the air resounded with the sonorous hexameters of virgil and the musical odes of horace in the irish-speaking portions of the country the hedge schoolmaster was often also a poet who wrote mellifluous songs in irish which were sung throughout the entire district and sometimes earned him enduring fame Uan Rud O'Sullivan and Andrew McGrath, called An Mangar Sugak, or the Jolly Peddler, are well known instances of this type. The poor scholar is another type that, under varying forms and under various circumstances, has ever trod the stage of Irish history from an ancient Irish manuscript. See O'Curry, Manners and Customs. Two seventy nine and eighty we learn that adamnan the biographer of st columcill and some other youth studied at clonard and were supported by the neighbourhood the poor scholar more than any other type embodies the love of learning of the irish race in the schools which preceded the national he appeared in a most interesting stage of development he came from a distance attracted by the reputation of a good teacher and the regularity of a well-conducted school he came avowedly poor his only claim on the generosity of his teacher and of the public was a marked aptitude for learning and an ardent desire for study and cultivation of mind he did not look for luxuries he was satisfied if his bodily wants were reasonably supplied even with the inconveniences of frequent change of abode a welcome was extended to him on all sides his hosts and patrons honoured his thirst for knowledge and tenacity of a purpose he was expected to help the students in the house where he found entertainment and it may not have been unpleasing to him on occasion to display his talents before his host when school was over it was not unusual to find him surrounded by a group of school companions each pressing his claim to entertain him for the night despite the hospitality of his patrons the poor scholar often felt the bitterness of his dependent state but he bore it with equanimity his hand ever eagerly stretched out for the prize of learning what did learning bring him why was he so eager to bear for its sake all the thousand aches that patient merit of the unworthy takes sometimes he became a priest sometimes his life was purposeless and void but he was ever urged onward by the fascination of learning and of the cultivation of the nobler part of his nature as might have been expected the irish who have emigrated to the american and australian continents have given touching proof of their devotion to the cause of learning I have space only for a few pathetic examples. An Irish workman in the United States, seeing my name in connection with an Irish dictionary, wrote to me a few years ago to ask how he might procure one, as, he said, an Italian in the works had asked him the meaning of Aaron Gobra, and he felt ashamed to be unable to explain it a man who at the age of three had emigrated from clare in the famine time wrote to me recently from australia in the irish language and character an old man named john o'regan of new zealand who had been twelve years in exile in the united states and forty-eight on the australian continent with failing eyesight in a letter that took him from january to june of the year nineteen hundred six to write 
endeavoured to set down scraps of irish lore which he had carried with him from the old country and which had clung to his memory to the last in my digging life in the quarries he says books were not a part of our swag prayer book accepted in eighteen seventy one when i had a long seat of work before me i sent for mccurtain's dictionary to melbourne it is old and wanting in the introductory part but for all was splendid and i loved it as my life c gaelic journal december nineteen hundred six references joyce a social history of ancient ireland two volumes second edition dublin nineteen thirteen healy ireland's ancient schools and scholars dublin eighteen ninety maynooth college centenary history dublin eighteen ninety five o'curry manners and customs of the ancient irish three volumes dublin and london eighteen seventy three manuscript materials of irish history reissue dublin eighteen seventy three carleton traits and stories of the irish peasantry especially volume three the poor scholar montalembert the monks of the west authorized translation seven volumes london eighteen sixty one meyer learning in ireland in the fifth century dublin nineteen thirteen Deneen, poems of uan rude o'sullivan introduction dublin nineteen o two the mag poets introduction dublin nineteen o six boyle the irish college in paris fifteen seventy eight to nineteen o one with a brief sketch of the other irish colleges in france dublin nineteen o one irish ecclesiastical record new series volume eight three hundred seven four hundred sixty five third series volume seven three hundred fifty four hundred thirty seven six hundred forty one end of section five section six of the glories of ireland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by abayi in june two thousand seventeen the glories of ireland edited by joseph dunn and p j lennox section six irish men of science by sir bertram c a windle s e d m d president university college cork we may divide our survey of the debt owed to ireland by science into three periods the earliest the intermediate and the latest in the earliest period the names which come before us are chiefly those of compilers such as augustine a monk and an irishman who wrote at carthage in africa in the seventh century a latin treatise on the wonderful things of the sacred scripture still extant in which in connection with joshua's miracle a very full account of the astronomical knowledge of the period ptolemaic but in many ways remarkably accurate is given there are however three distinguished names virgil the geometer that is fergil or ferrell was abbot of agabo went to the continent in seven forty one and was afterwards bishop of salzburg he died in seven eighty five he is remembered by his controversies with saint boniface one of which is concerned with the question of the antipodes Virgil is supposed to have been the first to teach that the earth is spherical. So celebrated was he that it has been thought that a part of the favour in which the author of the Aeneid was held by medieval churchmen was due to a confusion between his name and that of the geometer, sometimes spoken of as Saint Virgil. Dicuil, also an Irish monk, 
was the author of a remarkable work on geography, De Mensura Provinciarum Orbis Terrae, which was written in 825 and contains interesting references to Iceland and especially to the navigable canal which once connected the Nile with the Red Sea. He wrote between 814 and 816 a work on astronomy which has never been published. It is probable but not certain that he belonged to Clonmacnoise. Dungal, like the two others named above, was an astronomer. He probably belonged to Bangor and left his native land early in the ninth century. In 811 he wrote a remarkable work, Dungali reclusi epistola de duplici solis eclipsi anno octigenti decem ad carolum magnum. This letter, which is still extant, was written at the request of Charlemagne, who considered its author to be the most learned astronomer in existence and most likely to clear up the problem submitted to him. Before passing to the next period, a word should be said as to the medieval physicians, often if not usually belonging to families of medical men, such as the Leahes and Ohignes, and attached hereditarily to the greater clans. These men were chiefly compilers, but such works of theirs as we have throw light upon the state of medical knowledge in their day. Thus there is extant a treatise on Materia Medica, 1459, written by Cormac MacDunslepe, Dunlevy, hereditary physician to the clan of O'Donnell in Ulster. A more interesting work is the Cursus Medicus, consisting of six books on physiology, three on pathology and four on semiotica, written in the reign of Charles I of England by Niall O'Glacken, born in Donegal, and at one time physician to the King of France. O'Glacken's name introduces us to the middle period, if indeed it does not belong there. Inter arma silent leges, and it may be added scientific work. The troublous state of Ireland for many long years fully explains the absence of men of science in any abundance until the end of the eighteenth century. Still there are three names which can never be forgotten, belonging to the period in question. Sir Hans Sloane was born at Killily in Ulster in 1660. He studied medicine abroad, went to London where he settled, and was made a fellow of the Royal Society. He published a work on the West Indies but his claim to undying memory is the fact that it was the bequest of his most valuable and extensive collections to the nation, which was the beginning and foundation of the British Museum, perhaps the most celebrated institution of its kind in the world. Sloane's collection, it should be added, contained an immense number of valuable books and manuscripts, as well as of objects more usually associated with the idea of a museum. He died in 1753. The Honourable Robert Boyle was born at Lismer, in the county Waterford, in 1627, being the fourteenth child of the first Earl of Cork. On his tombstone he is described as the father of chemistry and the uncle of the Earl of Cork, and indeed, in his Skeptical Chemist, 1661, he assailed and for the time overthrew the idea of the alchemists that there was a materia prima, asserting as he did that theory of chemical elements, which held good until the discoveries in connection with radium led to a modification in chemical teaching. This may be said of Boyle that his writings profoundly modified scientific opinion, and his name will always stand in the forefront amongst those of chemists. He made important improvements in the air pump, was one of the earliest fellows of the Royal Society, and founded the Boyle Lectures. He died in 1691. Sir Thomas Molyneux was born in Dublin in 1661, of a family which had settled in Ireland about 1560 to 70. He practised as a physician in his native city, was the first person to describe the Irish elk, and to demonstrate the fact that the giant's causeway was a natural, and not, as had been previously supposed, an artificial production. He was the author of many other scientific observations. He died in 1733. 
we may now turn to more recent times and it will be convenient to divide our subjects according to the branch of science in which they were distinguished and to commence with mathematicians of whom ireland may boast of a most distinguished galaxy sir william rowan hamilton born in dublin eighteen o five died eighteen sixty five belonged to a family long settled in ireland but of scottish extraction he was a most precocious child he read hebrew at the age of seven and at twelve had studied latin greek and four leading continental languages as well as persian syriac arabic sanskrit and other tongues in eighteen nineteen he wrote a letter to the persian ambassador in that magnate's own language after these linguistic contests he early turned to mathematics in which he was apparently self-taught yet in his seventeenth year he discovered an error in laplace's mechanique celeste he entered trinity college where he won all kinds of distinctions being famous not merely as a mathematician but as a poet a scholar and a metaphysician he was appointed professor of astronomy and astronomer royal whilst still an undergraduate he predicted conical refraction afterwards experimentally proved by another irishman humphrey lloyd he twice received the gold medal of the royal society one for optical discoveries two for his theory of a general method of dynamics which resolves an extremely abstruse problem relative to a system of bodies in motion he was the discoverer of a new calculus that of quaternions which attracted the attention of professor tate of edinburgh and was by him made comprehensible to lesser mathematicians it is far too abstruse for description here sir george gabriel stokes born in sligo eighteen nineteen died nineteen o three was if not the greatest mathematician at least among the greatest of the last one hundred years he was educated in cambridge where he spent the rest of his life being appointed lucasian professor of mathematics in eighteen forty nine and celebrating the jubilee of that appointment in eighteen ninety nine he was member of parliament for his university and for a time occupied the presidential chair of the royal society he devoted himself inter alia to optical work and is perhaps best known by those researches which deal with the undulatory theory of light it was on this subject that he delivered the burnet lectures in aberdeen eighteen eighty three to eighteen eighty five james mccullough the son of a poor farmer was born in tyrone in eighteen o nine died eighteen forty seven his early death due to his own hand in a fit of insanity cut short his work but enough remains to permit him to rank amongst the great mathematicians of all time his most important work being his memoir on surfaces of the second order humphrey lloyd born in dublin eighteen hundred died eighteen eighty one fellow of the royal society his father was provost of trinity college dublin a position subsequently occupied also by the sun lloyd's work was chiefly concerned with optics and magnetism and it was in connection with the former that he carried out what was probably the most important single piece of work of his life namely the experimental proof of the phenomenon of conical refraction which had been predicted by sir william hamilton he was responsible for the erection of the magnetic observatory in dublin and the instruments used in it were constructed under his observation and sometimes from his designs or modifications he was also a meteorologist of distinction george salmon born in dublin eighteen nineteen died nineteen o four like the last mentioned subject was at the time of his death provost of trinity college dublin besides theological writings he contributed much to mathematical science especially in the directions of conic sections analytic geometry higher plane curves and the geometry of three dimensions he was a fellow of the royal society and received the copley and royal medals as well as distinctions from many universities and learned societies john casey born kilkenny eighteen twenty died eighteen ninety one fellow of the royal society 
was educated at a national school and became a teacher in one in later years entirely self-thought as a mathematician he raised himself from the humble position which he occupied to be a university professor in the catholic university of ireland and afterwards in the royal university and earned the highest reputation as one of the greatest authorities on plain geometry he was a correspondent of eminent mathematicians all over the world henry hennessy born in cork eighteen twenty six died nineteen o one fellow of the royal society was also a professor in the catholic university of ireland and afterwards in the royal college of science in dublin he was a writer on mathematics terrestrial physics and climatology benjamin williamson born in cork eighteen twenty seven fellow of the royal society is a senior fellow of trinity college dublin and a distinguished writer on mathematical subjects especially on the differential integral and infinitesimal calculuses sir joseph larmer born in antrim eighteen fifty seven fellow of the royal society was educated at queen's college belfast and in cambridge in which last place he has spent his life as a professor he now represents the university in parliament and is secretary to the royal society he is well known for his writings on the ether and on other physical as well as mathematical subjects astronomers william parsons earl of rossi born in york eighteen hundred died eighteen sixty seven fellow of the royal society was a very distinguished astronomer who experimented in fluid lenses and made great improvements in casting specula for reflecting telescopes from eighteen forty two to forty five he was engaged upon the construction in his park of parsonstown of his great reflecting telescope fifty eight feet long this instrument which cost thirty thousand pounds long remained the largest in the world he was president of the royal society from eighteen forty eight to eighteen fifty four sir howard grubb born eighteen forty four fellow of the royal society is known all over the world for his telescopes and for the remarkable advances which he has made in the construction of lenses for instruments of the largest size sir robert ball born in dublin eighteen forty died nineteen thirteen fellow of the royal society Originally Lord Rossi's astronomer at Parsonstown, he migrated as professor to Trinity College, Dublin, and subsequently became Laundian Professor of Astronomy at Cambridge. He was a great authority on the mathematical theory of screws, and his popular works on astronomy have made him known to a far wider circle of readers than those who can grapple with his purely scientific treatises. William Edward Wilson born county westmeath 1851 died 1908 fellow of the royal society a man of independent means he erected with the help of his father an astronomical observatory at his residence in this well-equipped building he made many photographic researches especially into the nature of nebulae he also devoted himself to solar physics and wrote some remarkable papers on the sudden appearance in 1903 of the star Nova Perse. He was the first to call attention to the probability that radium plays a part in the maintenance of solar heat. In fact, the science of radioactivity was engaging his keenest interest at the time of his early death. A. A. Rambert born waterford 1859 fellow of the royal society formerly astronomer royal for ireland and now radcliffe observer at oxford is one of the leading astronomers of the day physicists lord kelvin better known as sir william thompson born belfast 1824 died 1907 fellow of the royal society amongst the greatest physicists who have ever lived his name comes second only to that of newton he was educated at cambridge became professor of natural philosophy in glasgow university in eighteen forty six and celebrated the jubilee of his appointment in eighteen ninety six to the public his greatest achievement was the electric cabling of the atlantic ocean for which he was knighted in eighteen sixty six 
his electrometers and electric meters his sounding apparatus and his mariner's compass are all well known and highly valued instruments to his scientific fellows however his greatest achievements were in the field of pure science especially in connection with his thermodynamic researches including the doctrine of the dissipation of degradation of energy to this brief statement may be added mention of his work in connection with hydrodynamics and his magnetic and electric discoveries his papers in connection with wave and vortex movements are also most remarkable he was awarded the royal and copley medals and was an original member of the order of merit he received distinctions from many universities and learned societies george francis fitzgerald born dublin eighteen fifty one died nineteen o one fellow of the royal society was fellow and professor of natural philosophy in trinity college dublin where he was educated he was the first person to call the attention of the world to the importance of hertz's experiment perhaps his most important work interrupted by his labours in connection with education and terminated by his early death was that in connection with the nature of the ether george johnston stoney born king's county eighteen twenty six died nineteen eleven fellow of the royal society after being astronomer at parsonstown and professor of natural philosophy of galway became secretary to the queen's university and occupied that position until the dissolution of the university in eighteen eighty two he wrote many papers on geometrical optics and on molecular physics but his great claim to remembrance is that he first suggested on the basis of faraday's laws of electrolysis that an absolute unit of quantity of electricity exists in that amount of it which attends each chemical bond or valency and gave the name now generally adopted of electron to this small quantity he proposed the electronic theory of the origin of the complex ether vibrations which proceed from a molecule emitting light john tyndall born lethlin bridge county carlow eighteen twenty died eighteen ninety three fellow of the royal society professor at the royal institution and a fellow worker in many ways with huxley especially on the subject of glaciers he wrote also on heat as a mode of motion and was the author of many scientific papers but will perhaps be best remembered as the author of a presidential address to the british association in belfast eighteen seventy four which was the high-water mark of the mid-victorian materialism at its most triumphant moment chemists richard kirban born galway seventeen thirty three died eighteen twelve fellow of the royal society a man of independent means he devoted himself to the study of chemistry and mineralogy and was awarded the copley medal of the royal society he published works on mineralogy and on the analysis of mineral waters and was the first in ireland to publish analyses of soils for agricultural purposes a research which laid the foundation for scientific agriculture in great britain and ireland maxwell simpson born armagh eighteen fifteen died nineteen o two fellow of the royal society held the chair of chemistry in queen's college cork for twenty years and published a number of papers in connection with his subject and especially with the behaviour of cyanides with the study of which compounds his name is most associated cornelius o'sullivan born brandon eighteen forty one died eighteen ninety seven fellow of the royal society was for many years chemist to the great firm of bass and company brewers of burton on trent and in that capacity became one of the leading exponents of the chemistry of fermentation in the world james emerson reynolds born dublin eighteen forty four fellow of the royal society professor of chemistry trinity college dublin for many years discovered the primary thiocarbamide and a number of other chemical substances including a new class of colloids and several groups of organic and other compounds of the element silicon among others only the names of the following can be mentioned 
Sir Robert Kane, born Dublin 1809, died 1890, Professor of Chemistry in Dublin and founder and first director of the Museum of Industry, now the National Museum. He was president of Queen's College, Cork, as was William K. Sullivan, born Cork 1822, died 1890, formerly professor of chemistry in the Catholic University. Sir William O'Shaughnessy Brooke, fellow of the Royal Society, born Limerick 1809, died 1889, professor of chemistry and assay master in Calcutta, is better known as the introducer of the telegraphic system into India and its first superintendent. Biologists William Henry Harvey, born Limerick, 1814, died 1866, Fellow of the Royal Society, was a botanist of very great distinction. During a lengthy residence in South Africa, he made a careful study of the flora of the Cape of Good Hope and published The Genera of South African Plants. After this, he was made keeper of the herbarium, Trinity College, Dublin, but, obtaining leave of absence, travelled in North and South America, exploring the coast from Halifax to the Keys of Florida, in order to collect materials for his great work Nereis Boreali Americana, published by the Smithsonian Institution. Subsequently he visited Ceylon, Australia, Tasmania, New Zealand, and the Friendly and Fiji Islands, collecting algae. The results were published in his Phycologia Australis. At the time of his death he was engaged on his Flora Capensis, and was generally considered the first authority on algae in the world. William Archer, born County Down, 1837, died 1897, Fellow of the Royal Society, devoted his life to the microscopic examination of freshwater organisms, especially desmids and diatoms. He attained a very prominent place in this branch of work among men of science. Perhaps his most remarkable discovery was that of Chlamydomyxa labyrintholoides in 1868, one of the most remarkable and enigmatical of all known microscopical organisms. George James Allman, born Cork, 1812, died 1898, Fellow of the Royal Society, Professor of Botany in Trinity College, Dublin, and afterwards Regius Professor of Natural History in the University of Edinburgh, published many papers on botanical and zoological subjects, but his great work was that on the gymnoblastic hydrozoa, without doubt the most important systematic work dealing with the group of coelenterata that has ever been produced. Amongst eminent living members of the class under consideration may be mentioned Alexander McAllister, born Dublin 1844, Fellow of the Royal Society, Professor of Anatomy, first in Dublin and now in Cambridge, an eminent morphologist and anthropologist, and Henry Horatio Dixon, born Dublin, Fellow of the Royal Society, Professor of Botany in Trinity College, an authority on vegetable physiology, especially problems dealing with the sap. Geologists Samuel Horton, born Carlow, 1821, died 1897, Fellow of the Royal Society. After earning a considerable reputation as a mathematician and a geologist, and taking Anglican orders, determined to study medicine and entered the school of that subject in Trinity College. After graduating, he became the reformer, it might even be said, the re-founder of that school. He devoted ten years to the study of the mechanical principles of muscular action and published his Animal Mechanism, probably his greatest work. He will long be remembered as the introducer of the long drop as a method of capital execution. He might have been placed in several of the categories which have been dealt with, but that of geologist has been selected, since in the later part of his most versatile career he was Professor of Geology in Trinity College, Dublin. Valentine Ball, born Dublin, 1843, died 1894, Fellow of the Royal Society, a brother of Sir Robert, joined the Geological Survey of India, 
and in that capacity became an authority not only on geology but also on ornithology and anthropology his best known work is jungle life in india in later life he was director of the national museum dublin medical science very brief note can be taken of the many shining lights in irish medical science robert james graves seventeen ninety six to eighteen fifty three fellow of the royal society after whom is named graves disease was one of the greatest of clinical physicians his system of clinical medicine was a standard work and was extolled by trousseau the greatest physician that france has ever had in the highest terms of appreciation william stokes 1804 to 1878 regius professor of medicine in trinity college and the author of a theory and practice of medicine known all over the civilized world was equally celebrated to these must be added sir dominic corrigan 1802 to 1880 the first catholic to occupy the position of president of the college of physicians in dublin an authority on heart disease and the first adequate describer of aortic patency a form of ailment long called corrigan's disease collis's fracture is a familiar term in the mouths of surgeons it derives its name from abraham collis seventeen seventy three to eighteen forty three the first surgeon in the world to tie the innominate artery as butcher's saw a well-known implement thus from another eminent surgeon richard butcher regius professor in trinity college in the seventies of the last century sir rupert boyce eighteen sixty three to nineteen eleven fellow of the royal society though born in london had an irish father and mother entering the medical profession he was assistant professor of pathology at university college london and subsequently professor of pathology in university college liverpool which he was largely instrumental in turning into the university of liverpool he was foremost in launching and directing the liverpool school of tropical medicine which has had such widespread results all over the world in elucidating the problems and checking the ravages of the diseases peculiar to hot countries it was for his services in this direction that he was knighted in 1906. Sir Richard Quain, born Mallow, 1816, died 1898, Fellow of the Royal Society, spent most of his life in London, where he was for years the most prominent physician. He wrote on many subjects, but the Dictionary of Medicine, which he edited and which bears his name, has made itself and its editor known all over the world sir elmroth white born eighteen sixty one fellow of the royal society is the greatest living authority on the important subject of vaccinotherapy which indeed may be said to owe its origin to his researches as do the methods for measuring the protective substances in the human blood he was the discoverer of the anti-typhoid injection which has done so much to stay the ravages of that disease engineering bindon blood stoney eighteen twenty eight to nineteen o nine fellow of the royal society made his reputation first as an astronomer by discovering the spiral character of the great nebula in andromeda turning to engineering he was responsible for the construction of many important works especially in connection with the port of dublin he was brother of g j stoney sir charles parsons born eighteen fifty four fellow of the royal society fourth son of the third earl of rossi is the engineer who developed the steam turbine system and made it suitable for the generation of electricity and for the propulsion of war and mercantile vessels if he has revolutionized traffic on the water so on the land has john boyd dunlop still living who discovered the pneumatic tire with such widespread results for motor cars, bicycles, and such means of locomotion. Miscellaneous Admiral Sir Leopold MacClintock, born Dundalk, 1819, died 1907, Fellow of the Royal Society, 
was one of the great arctic explorers having spent eleven navigable seasons and six winters in those regions he was the chief leader and organizer of the franklin searches from the scientific point of view he made a valuable collection of miocene fossils from greenland and enabled Horton to prepare the geological map and memoir of the Perry Archipelago. John Ball, born Dublin 1818, died 1889, Fellow of the Royal Society, educated at Oscott, passed the examination for a high degree at Cambridge, but, being a Catholic, was excluded from the degree itself and any other honours which a Protestant might have attained to. He travelled widely and published many works on the natural history of Europe and South America, from Panama to Tierra del Fuego. He was the first to suggest the utilization of the electric telegraph for meteorological purposes connected with storm warnings. Space ought to be found for a cursory mention of that strange person, Dionysus Lardner, 1793-1859, who by his Lardner's Cyclopedia in 132 volumes, his Cabinet Library and his Museum of Science and Art did much to popularize science in an unscientific day. References The principal sources of information are the National Dictionary of Biography, the Obituary Notices of the Royal Society, passages in inverted commas are from these, Who's Who, for living persons, Healy, Ireland's Ancient Schools and Scholars, Hyde, Literary History of Ireland, Joyce, Social History of Ancient Ireland, Moore, Medicine in the British Isles. End of section 6「Section seven of the Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Law in Ireland by Lawrence Ginnell. B. L. M. P. A Distinction Ireland having been a self-ruled country for a stretch of some two thousand years, then violently brought under subjection to foreign rule, regaining legislative independence for a brief period toward the close of the eighteenth century, then by violence and corruption deprived of that independence and again brought under the same foreign rule to which it is still subject the expression law in ireland comprises the native and the foreign the laws devised by the irish nation for its own governance and the laws imposed upon it from without two sets codes or systems proper to two entirely distinct social structures having no relation and but little resemblance to each other whatever may be thought of either as law the former is irish in every sense and vastly the more interesting historically archaeologically philologically and in many other ways the latter being english law in ireland and not truly irish in any sense origin and character of irish law shenecus agus Phoenicus na erin is hiberniae antiquitates a sanctionis legalis the ancient laws and decisions of the feni of ireland shan or shan that is old differs from most gaelic adjectives in preceding the noun it qualifies it also tends to coalesce and become a prefix shanicus that is ancient law phoenicus that is the law of the feni who were the milesian farmers free members of the clans the most important class in the ancient irish community their laws were composed in their contemporary language the berla feni a distinct form of gaelic 
several nations of the aryan race are known to have cast into metre or rhythmical prose their laws and other such knowledge as they desired to communicate preserve and transmit before writing came into use the irish went further and for greater facility in committing to memory and retaining there put their laws into a kind of rhymed verse of which they may have been the inventors by this device aided by the isolated geographical position of ireland the sanctity of age and the apprehension that any change of word or phrase might change the law itself these archaic laws when subsequently committed to writing were largely preserved from the progressive changes to which all spoken language are subject with the result that we have to-day embedded in the gaelic text and commentaries of the shenkis moor the book of asil and other law works available in english translations made under a royal commission appointed by government in eighteen fifty two and published at intervals extending over forty years in six volumes of ancient laws and institutions of ireland a mass of archaic words phrases law literature and information on the habits and manners of the people not equalled in antiquity quantity or authenticity in any other celtic source in english they are commonly called brain laws from the genitive case singular of bretham that is judge genitive brain as aaron is an oblique case of ire and as latin words are sometimes adopted in the genitive in modern languages which themselves have no case distinctions it is not to be inferred from this name that the laws are judge made they are rather case law in parts possibly enacted by some of the various assemblies at which the laws were promulgated or rehearsed but for the most part simple declarations of law originating in custom and moral justice and records of judgments based upon the precedents and commentaries in the sort of cases common to agricultural communities of the time many of the provisions being as inapplicable to modern life as modern laws would be to ancient life a reader is impressed by the extraordinary number and variety of cases with their still more numerous details and circumstances accumulated in the course of long ages the manner in which the laws are inextricably interwoven with the interlocking clan system and the absence of scientific arrangement or guiding principle except those of moral justice clemency and the good of the community this defect in arrangement is natural in writings intended as these were for the use of judges and professors experts in the subjects with which they deal but makes the task of presenting a concise statement of them difficult and uncertain society law the law and the social system were inseparable parts of a complicated whole mutually cause and consequence of each other thua clan kinel kine and finye were terms used to denote a tribe or set of relatives in reality or by adoption claiming descent from a common ancestor forming a community occupying and owning a given territory thua in course of time came to be applied indifferently to the people and to their territory finye sometimes designating a whole tribe more frequently meant a part of it occupying a distinct portion of the territory a potential microcosm or nucleus of a clan having limited autonomy in the conduct of its own immediate affairs the constitution of this organism whether as contemplated by the law or in the less perfect actual practice is alike elusive and underwent changes for the purpose of illustration the finye may be said to consist theoretically of the seventeen men frequently mentioned throughout the laws namely the flafinye that is chief of the finye the gelfinye that is his four full-grown sons or other nearest male relatives the derfinye tarfinye and infinye each consisting of four heads of families in wider concentric circles of kinship say first second and third cousins of the flafinye 
the finier was liable in measure determined by those circles for contracts fines and damages incurred by any of its members so far as his own property was insufficient and was in the same degree entitled to share advantages of a like kind accruing intermarriage within this finier was prohibited the modern term sept is applied sometimes to this group and sometimes to a wider group united under a flaw that is chief elected by the flaw finiers and provided for his public services with free land proportionate to the area of the district and the number of clansmen in it clan might mean the whole irish nation or an intermediate homogeneous group of finiers having for wider purposes a flaw or re thua that is king of one thua elected by the flaws and flaw finiers subject to elaborate qualifications as to person character and training which limited their choice and provided with a larger portion of free land this was the lowest chief to whom the title re re that is rex or king was applied a group of these kinglets connected by blood or territory or policy and their flaws elected from a still narrower circle of specially trained men within their own rank the remortua kings of the territory so composed to whose office a still larger area of free land was attached in turn kings of this class with their respective sub-kings and flaws elected from among the riochdauna that is materia principum or king timber a royal finier specially educated and trained a requi supreme over five remorthuas roughly a fourth of ireland these with their respective principal supporters elected the ardry supreme king of ireland who for ages held his court and national assemblies at tara and enjoyed the kingdom of mita for his mensa land usually the election was not direct to the kingship but to the position of tanista second in authority heir apparent to the kingship this was also the rule in the learned professions and noble arts which were similarly endowed with free land the most competent among those specially trained whether son or outsider should succeed to the position in land all such land was legally indivisible and inalienable and descended in its entirety to the successor who might or might not be a relative of the occupant the beneficiaries were however free to retain any land that belonged to them as private individuals membership of the clan was an essential qualification for every position but occasionally two clans amalgamated or a small finier or desirable individual was co-opted into the clan in other words naturalized the rules of kinship determined enyaklung honor value the assessed value of status with its correlative rights obligations and liabilities in connection with all matters civil and criminal largely supplied the place of contract endowed members of the clan with birthrights and bound them into a compact social political and mutual insurance copartnership self-controlled and self-reliant rested on the twofold basis of kinship and property expanding as a clansman by acquisition of property and a fluxion of time progressed upward from one grade to another diminishing if he sank vanishing if for crime he was expelled from the clan fosterage to our minds one of the most curious customs prevalent among the ancient irish was that of irad also called altar that is fosterage curious in itself and in the fact that in all the abundance of law and literature relating to it no logically valid reason is given why wealthy parents normally put out their children from one year old to fifteen in the case of a daughter and to seventeen in the case of a son to be reared in another family while perhaps receiving and rearing children of other parents sent to them as modern life does not comprise either the custom or a reason for it we may assume that fosterage was a consequence of the clan system and that its practice strengthened the ties of kinship and sympathy 
this conjecture is corroborated by the numerous instances in history and in story of fosterage affection proving when tested stronger than the natural affection of relatives by birth what is more long after the dissolution of the clans fosterage has continued stealthily in certain districts in which the old race of chiefs and clansmen contrived to cling together to the old sod and the affection generated by it has been demonstrated down to the middle of the nineteenth century the present writer has heard it spoken of lovingly in half irish by simple old people whom to question would be cruel and irreverent land law the entire territory was originally and always continued to be the absolute property of the entire clan not even the private residence of a clansman with its mandigona that is little lawn or precinct of sanctuary within which himself and his family and property were inviolable could be sold to an outsider private ownership though rather favoured in the administration of the law was prevented from becoming general by the fundamental ownership of the clan and the birthright of every free-born clansman to a sufficiency of the land of his native territory for his subsistence the land officially held as described was not until the population became numerous a serious encroachment upon this right what remained outside this and the residential patches of private land was classified as cultivable and uncultivable the former was the common property of the clansmen but was held and used in severalty for the time being subject to gaul Kinney, clan resumption and redistribution by authority of an assembly of the clan or finye at intervals of from one to three years according to local customs and circumstances for the purpose of satisfying the rights of young clansmen and dealing with any land left derelict by death or forfeiture compensation being paid for any unexhausted improvements the clansmen being owners in this limited sense and the only owners had no rent to pay they paid tribute for public purposes such as the making of roads to the flaw as a public officer as they were bound to render or had the privilege of rendering according to how they regarded it military service when required not to the flaw as a feudal lord which he was not but to the clan of which the flaw was head and representative the uncultivable unreclaimed forest mountain and bog land was common property in the wider sense that there was no several appropriation of it even temporarily by individuals it was used promiscuously by the clansmen for grazing stock procuring fuel pursuing game or any other advantage yielded by it in its natural state kings and flaws were great stock owners and were allowed to let for short terms portions of their official lands what they more usually let to clansmen was cattle to graze either on private land or on a specified part of the official land not measured but calculated according to the number of beasts it was able to support a flaw whose stock for letting ran short hired some from a king and sublet them to his own people a fena etec or calye as a farmer was generally called might hire stock in one of two distinct ways ser free which was regulated by the law left his status unimpaired could not be terminated arbitrarily or unjustly under which he paid one-third of the value of the stock yearly for seven years at the end of which time what remained of the stock became his property and in any dispute relating to which he was competent to sue or defend even though the flaw gave evidence or dare bond which was matter of bargain and not of law was subject to onerous conditions and contingencies including maintenance of kings flaws or brands with their retinues on visitations of disbanded soldiers etc under which the stock always remained the property of the flaw regarding which the kelia could not give evidence against that of the flaw which degraded the kelia and his finye and impaired their status a bargain therefore which could not be entered into without the sanction of the finye 
this prohibition was rendered operative by the legal provision that in case of default the flaw could not recover from the finye unless their consent had been obtained the letting of stock especially of darstock increased the flaw's power as a lender over borrowers subject however to the check that his rank in enyoklong depended on the number of independent clansmen in his district though workers in precious metals as their ornaments show the ancient irish did not coin or use money sales were by barter all payments tribute rent fulfilment of contract fine damages wages or however else arising were made in kind horses cows store cattle sheep pigs corn meal malt bacon salt beef geese butter honey wool flax yarn cloth dye plants leather manufactured articles of use or ornament gold and silver whatever one party could spare and the other find a use for tributes and rent being alike paid in kind and to the same person were easily confused this tempted the flaw as the system relaxed to extend his official power in the direction of ownership but never to the extent of enabling him to evict a clansman for a crime a clansman might be expelled from clan and territory but apart from crime the idea of eviction from one's homestead was inconceivable not even when a darkelia or unfree peasant failed to make the stipulated payments could the flaw do more than sue as for any other debt and if successful he was bound in seizing to leave the family food material and implements necessary for living and recovering law of distraining Aguil, that is distress was a universal legal mode of obtaining anything due or justice or redress in any matter whether civil or criminal contract or tort every command or prohibition of the law if not obeyed was enforced by Aguil. the brehons reduced all liabilities of whatsoever origin to material value to be recovered by this means hence its great importance the vast amount of space devoted to it in the laws and the fact that the law of distress deals incidentally with every other branch of law and reveals best the customs habits and character of the people a claimant in a civil case might either summon his debtor before a brehon get a judgment and seize the amount adjudged or by distraining first at his own risk force the defendant either to pay or stop the seizure by submitting the matter in dispute to trial before a brehon whom he then could choose there was no officer corresponding to a sheriff to distrain and realize the amount judged the person entitled had to do it himself accompanied by a law agent and witnesses after in distress with time elaborate notices at intervals of time sufficient to allow the defendant to consider his position and find means of satisfying the claim if he could in a proper case his hands were strengthened by very explicit provisions of the law if a man who is sued evades justice knowing the debt to be due of him double the debt is payable by him in urgent cases immediate distress was allowed in either case the property seized usually cattle was not taken to the plaintiff's home but put into a pound and by similar easy stages became his property to the amount of the debt the costs were paid out of what remained and any ultimate remainder was returned on a fujur that is serf or other unfree person resident in the territory incurring liability to a clansman the latter might proceed against the flaw on whose land the defendant lived or might seize immediately any property the defendant owned and if he owned none might seize him and make him work off the debt in slavery seizure of property of a person of higher rank than the plaintiff had to be preceded by trusca that is fasting upon him this consisted in waiting at the door of the defendant's residence without food until the debt was paid or a pledge given the laws contained no process more strongly enforced than this a defendant who allowed a plaintiff properly fasting to die of hunger was held by law and by public opinion guilty of murder 
and completely lost his inachlan both text and commentary declare that whoever refuses to cede a just demand when fasted upon shall pay double that amount if the faster having accepted a pledge did not in due course receive satisfaction of his claim he forthwith distrained taking and keeping double the amount of the debt the law did not allow those whom it at first respected to trifle with justice trusca is believed to have been of druidical origin and it retained throughout even in christian times a sort of supernatural significance whoever disregarded it became an outcast and incurred risks and dangers too grave to be lightly faced besides being a legal process it was resorted to as a species of elaborate prayer or curse a kind of magic for achieving some difficult purpose this mysterious character enhanced its value in a legal system deficient in executive power non-citizens from what precedes it will be understood that there were in ancient ireland from prehistoric times people not comprised in the clan organization and therefore not enjoying its rights and advantages or entitled to any of its land some of whom were otherwise free within certain areas while some were serfs and some slaves those outsiders are conjectured to have originated in the earlier colonists subdued by the milesians and reduced to an inferior condition but the distinction did not wholly follow racial lines persons of pre-milesian race are known to have risen to eminence while milesians are known to have sunk from crime or other causes to the lowest rank of the unfree here and there a dar dua that is bond community of an earlier race held together down to the middle ages in districts in which conquest had left them and to which they were restricted beyond that restriction exclusion from the clan and its power some peculiarities of dialect dress and manners and a tradition of inferiority such as still exists in certain parishes they were not molested provided they paid tribute which may have been heavy there were also bothocks that is cotiers and chancletes that is old adherents of a flaw accustomed to serve him and obtain benefits from him if they had resided in the territory for three generations and been industrious thrifty and orderly on a few of them joining their property together to the number of one hundred head of cattle they could emancipate themselves by appointing a flaw finier and getting admitted to the clan till this was done they could neither sue nor defend nor inherit and the flaw was answerable for their conduct there being no prisons or convict settlements any person of whatever race convicted of grave crime or of cowardice on the field of battle and unable to pay the fines imposed captives taken in foreign wars fugitives from other clans and tramps fell into the lowest ranks of the fooder serfs it was as a captive that st patrick was brought in his youth to ireland the law allowed rather than entitled a flaw to keep unfree people for servile occupations and the performance of unskilled labour for the public benefit in reality they worked for his personal profit oftentimes at the expense of the clan they lived on his land and he was responsible for their conduct by analogy the distinctions ser and der were recognized among them according to origin character and means where these elements continued to be favourable for three generations progress upward was made and ultimately a number of them could club together appoint a flaw finier and apply to be admitted to the clan a mog was a slave in the strict sense usually purchased as such from abroad and legally and socially lower than the lowest fooder Duraldus cambrensis writing towards the close of the twelfth century tells us that english parents then frequently sold their surplus children and other persons to the irish as slaves the church repeatedly intervened for the release of captives and mitigation of their condition the whole institution of slavery was strongly condemned as unchristian by the synod held in armagh in 1171 criminal law though there are numerous laws relating to crime to be found chiefly in the book of Asel, 
criminal law in the sense of a code of punishment there was none the law took cognizance of crime and wrong of every description against person character and property and its function was to prevent and restrict crime and when committed to determine according to the facts of the case and the respective ranks of the parties the value of the compensation or reparation that should be made it treated crime as a mode of incurring liability entitled the sufferer or if he was murdered his finye to bring the matter before a brehon who on hearing the case made the complicated calculations and adjustments rendered necessary by the facts proved and by the grades to which the respective parties belonged arrived at and gave judgment for the amount of the compensation armed with which judgment the plaintiff could immediately distrain for that amount the property of the criminal and in his default that of his finye the finye could escape part of its liability by arresting and giving up the convict or by expelling him and giving substantial security against his future misdeeds from the number of elements that entered into the calculation of a fine it necessarily resulted that like fines by no means followed like crimes fines like all other payments were adjudged and paid in kind being in some cases of the destruction of property generic a quantity of that kind of property large fines were usually adjudged to be paid in three species one-third in each the plaintiff taking care to inform correctly the brehon of the kinds of property the defendant possessed because he could seize only that named and if the defendant did not possess it the judgment was a blind nut crime against the state or community such as wilful disturbance of an assembly was punished severely these were the only cases to which the law attached a sentence of death or other corporal punishment for nothing whatsoever between parties did the law recognize any duty of revenge retaliation or the infliction of personal punishment but only the payment of compensation personal punishment was regarded as the commission of a second crime on account of a first there was no duty to do this but the right to do it was tacitly recognized if a criminal resisted or evaded payment of an adjudged compensation criminal were distinguished from civil cases only by the moral element the sufferer's right in all cases to choose a brehon the loss of an auclon partial or whole according to the magnitude of the crime the elements used in calculating the amount of the fine and the technical terms employed the jire was a general name for a fine and there were specific names for classes of fines eric that is reparation redemption was the fine for killing a human being the amount being affected by the distinction between murder and manslaughter and by other circumstances but in no case was a violent death however innocent allowed to pass without reparation being made a fine was awarded out of the property of the convict or of his finye to the finye of the person slain in the proportions in which they were entitled to inherit his property that being also according to their degrees of kinship and the degrees in which they were really sufferers this gave every clan and every clansman in addition to their moral interest a direct monetary interest in the prevention and suppression of crime hence the whole public feeling of the country was entirely in support of the law the honour and interest of community and individual being involved in its maintenance the injured person or finye if unable to recover the fine might in capital cases seize and enslave or even kill the convict probably restrained by the fact that there being no officers of criminal law they had to inflict punishment themselves they sometimes imprisoned a convict in a small island or sent him adrift on the sea in a curragh or boat of hide law supported by public opinion powerful because so inspired powerful because unanimous was difficult to evade or resist it so strongly armed an injured person and so utterly paralyzed a criminal that escape from justice was hardly possible the only way in which it was possible was by flight leaving all one's property behind and sinking into slavery in a strange place and this in effect was a severe punishment 
rather than an escape foreign law the danes and other norsemen were the buccaneers of northwestern europe from the eighth to the eleventh century they conquered and settled permanently in neustria from them called normandy and conquered and ruled for a considerable time england and part of scotland and the isles in ireland they were little more than marauders having permanent colonies only round the coast always subject nominally at least to the ardre or to the local chief paying him tribute when he was strong raiding his territory when he was weak and fomenting recurrent disorder highly prejudicial to law religion and civilization they never made any pretence of extending their laws to ireland and their attempt to conquer the country was finally frustrated at clontarf in ten fourteen the anglo-norman invaders also seized the seaports the earlier of them who went inland partially adopted in the second generation the gaelic language laws and customs as many non-celtic lowlanders of scotland about the same period adopted the gaelic language laws and customs of the highlanders hence they did not make much impression on the gaelic system beyond the disintegrating effect of their imperfect adoption of it into the eastern parts of ireland however a fresh stream of english adventurers continued to flow as aggressive and covetous as their means and prudence permitted calling so much of the country as they were able to wrench from the irish the english pale which fluctuated in extent with their fortunes and when compelled to pay tribute to irish chiefs calling it black rent to indicate how they regarded it their greatest difficulty was to counteract the tendency of the earlier colonists to become hibernicized a most unwilling tribute to the superiority of the irish race they and still more those in england who supported them knew nothing of the irish language laws and institutions but that they should all be impartially hated uprooted and supplanted by english people and everything english as soon as means enabled this to be done this was the amiable purpose of the pompously named statute of kilkenny passed by about a score of these colonists in thirteen sixty seven presuming to speak in the name of ireland the statute prohibited the english colonists from becoming irish in the numerous ways they were accustomed to do and excluded all irish priests from preferment in the church partly because their superior virtue would by contrast amount to a censure the purpose was not completely successful even within the pale outside that precinct the mass of the irish were wholly unconscious of the existence of the statute of kilkenny but expressing as the statute did correctly the views of fresh adventurers it became in arrogance and in the pretension to speak for the whole of ireland a model for their future legislation and policy under king henry the sixth of england richard duke of york being lord deputy the parliament of the pale assembled in dublin repudiated the authority of the english parliament in ireland established a mint and assumed an attitude of almost complete independence on the other hand in fourteen ninety four under henry the seventh the parliament of the pale assembled at drogheda passed poynings act extending all english laws to ireland and subjecting all laws passed in ireland to revision by the english council this extended to the whole of ireland as english power extended remained in force until seventeen eighty two henry the eighth was the first english sovereign to take practical measures for the pacific and diplomatic conquest of the whole of ireland and the substitution of english for irish institutions and methods his daughter queen elizabeth continued and completed the conquest but it was by drenching the country in blood by more than decimating the irish people and by reducing the remnant to something like the condition of the ancient feudor her policy prepared the ground for her successor james i to exterminate the irish from large tracts in which he planted englishmen and scotchmen and to extend all english laws to ireland and abolish all other laws james's english attorney-general in ireland sir john davies in his work a discovery of the true causes etc says 
for there is no nation of people under the sun that doth love equal and indifferent that is impartial justice better than the irish or will rest better satisfied with the execution thereof although it be against themselves so as they may have the protection and benefit of the law when upon just cause they do desire it the ancient irish loved their laws and took pride in obeying and enforcing them the different attitude of the modern irish towards foreign laws and administration is amply explained by the morally indefensible character of those laws and that administration to be read in english statutes and ordinances and in the history of english rule in ireland a subject too vast and harrowing and in every sense foreign to what has gone before to be entered upon here though the parliament of seventeen eighty two to eighteen hundred was little more than a pale parliament in which the mass of the irish people had no representation whatsoever one of its acts to its credit be it said was an attempt to mitigate the penal laws and emancipate the oppressed gaelic and catholic population of ireland with the partial exception of that brief interval law in ireland has during the last three hundred sixty years meant english laws specially enacted for the destruction of any irish trade or industry that entered into competition with a corresponding english trade or industry in later times those crude barbarities have been gradually superseded by the more defensible laws now in force in ireland all of which can be studied in statutes passed by the parliament since the union with scotland called british references pending the desirable work of a more competent brehon law commission and translators the subject must be studied in the six volumes of ancient laws of ireland produced by the first commission from eighteen sixty five to nineteen hundred one ignoring the long introductions and many of the notes whitley stokes criticism of atkinson's glossary london nineteen hundred three r de Reste, Etudes de Histoire de Droit, Paris, eighteen eighty nine, Dubois de Jouvenville, and Paul Colinet, Etudes sur le droit Celtique, two volumes, Paris, eighteen ninety five, Joyce, Social History of Ancient Ireland, two volumes, London, nineteen thirteen, Lawrence Ginnell, The Brehan Laws, London, eighteen ninety four. End of section 7section 8 of the glories of ireland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by Matt Perard. the glories of ireland edited by joseph dunn and p j lennox irish music by w h Gretan flood muse d m r i a k s g perhaps nothing so strikingly brings home the association of ireland with music as the fact that the harp is emblazoned on the national arms ireland the mother of sweet singers as pope writes ireland where according to st columcille the clerics sing like the birds ireland can proudly point to a musical history of over two thousand years the milesians the de danans and other pre-christian colonists were musical Hecateus, b c five forty to four seventy five describes the celts of ireland as singing songs to the harp in praise of apollo and ethicus of istria a christian philosopher of the early fourth century describes the culture of the irish certainly it is that even before the coming of st patrick the irish were a highly cultured nation and the national apostle utilized music and song in his work of conversion in the early lives of the irish saints musical references abound and the irish school of music attracted foreign scholars from the sixth to the ninth century hymnologists are familiar with the hymns written by early irish saints and legs e g 
saint sechemont saint columcio saint molles saint cochine saint columbanus saint ulton saint colman saint comaine saint angus dongo sedulius mongo and others who has not heard of the great music school of san gallen founded by saint gall the wonder and delight of europe with a flock german students one of the irish monks tutal tutilo composed numerous sacred pieces including the famous forest curie fons bonititis fons bonitatis included in the vatican edition of the curiel nineteen o six not alone did irish monks propagate sacred and secular music throughout france italy switzerland austria germany and the far north but they made their influence felt in lindisfarne malmesbury glastonbury and other cities in england as also in scotland st aldheim one of the pupils of st maldo tells us that at the close of the seventh century ireland synonymous with learning literally blazed like the stars of the firmament with the glory of her scholars during the ninth century we meet with twelve different forms of instruments in use by the irish namely the cruet and clairsage small and large harp timpan rota or bowed cruet wen oboe or bassoon benbubal and corn horn christianum and piaf bagpipes fiera flute or fife gothwain bass horn stock and sternum trumpet pepe single and double pipes crab keel and cron keel cymbalum canano castanet and fidil fiddle the so-called brian borrell's harp really dates from the thirteenth century and is now in trinity college dublin but there are numerous sculptured harps of the ninth and tenth centuries on the crosses at gray ullard clan macnoise duro and monaster voice Danchay, an irish bishop of the ninth century who died as abbot of st remigius wrote a commentary of martianus capella a well-known musical textbook towering above all his fellows john scotus eragina in eighteen sixty seven wrote a tract de divisione de division naturae in which he expounds organum or discant nearly a hundred years before the appearance of the scolia incariades incariades and the musica incariades he also wrote a commentary on martianus capella now in a paris manuscript of the ninth century the eulogy of geraldus cambrensis or gerald barry who came to ireland in eleven eighty three on irish harpers and minstrels is too well known to be repeated but brompton and john of salisbury are equally enthusiastic round bass or pedal point and singing in parts as well as bands of harpers and pipers were in vogue in ireland before the coming of the english dante quoted by galilei testifies to the fact that italy received the harp from ireland and it may be added the irish harp suggested the pianoforte in the anglo-norman ballad the entrenchment of new ross in twelve sixty five allusion is made to pipes and flutes and carols and dancing another poem dating from about thirteen twenty refers to irish dances in a flattering manner john garland eleven ninety to twelve sixty four wrote a treatise on organum and outlined a scheme of dividing the interval which developed into ornamentation passing notes and grace notes the dublin troper of the thirteenth century has a number of forest curies and glorias also a collection of sequences a dublin processionale 
of the fourteenth century contains the most elaborate form of the officium sepulchre with musical notation on a four-line stave the foundation of the miracle play of the resurrection another dublin trover dates from thirteen sixty and was used in st patrick's cathedral it contains the hymn angelus ad virginum alluded to by chaucer the christ church psaltery about thirteen seventy has musical notation and is exquisitely illuminated lionel power an anglo-irishman wrote the first english treatise on music in thirteen ninety five exactly a century later in fourteen ninety five a music school was founded in christ church cathedral dublin the irish annals of the thirteenth to the fifteenth century have numerous references to distinguished harpers and singers and there are still sung many beautiful airs of this period including the cullen and Aibling Aroon. John Lawless was a famous Irish organ builder of the second half of the fifteenth century, and his successor, James Dempsey, built many fine organs between the years fifteen thirty and fifteen sixty five. Notwithstanding the many penal en enactments against Irish minstrels, all the great Anglo Irish nobles of the Pale retained an Irish harper and piper in their service under date of fourteen eighty we find chief justice birmingham having an irish harper to teach his family as also to harp and to dance a century later line crews the harper richard crews composed a lamentation song on the fall of the baron of slang the air of which is still popular it is to the credit of the irishman william bath who subsequently became a jesuit that he wrote the first printed english treatise on music published in fifteen eighty four thus antedating by thirteen years morley's work bath wrote a second musical treatise in fifteen eighty seven and he was the first to call measures by the name of bars he also formulated methods of transposition and sight reading that may still be studied with profit thomas campion the poet and composer was born in dublin in fifteen sixty seven but spent nearly all his life in england other irish composers to mention only the most distinguished were william costello madrigalis richard gilly edward shergold and walter kennedy strange as it may seem queen elizabeth retained in her service an irish harper cormac mcdermott from fifteen ninety one to sixteen o three and on the death of the queen he was given an annual pension of forty six pounds ten shillings ten d nearly five hundred pounds a year of our present money shakespeare refers to eleven irish tunes of which the famous calaine of astur me is still fresh irish dances were extremely popular at the english court from sixteen hundred to sixteen o three and were introduced into the masks shakespeare's intrinsic friend john dowland of dublin was one of the greatest lutenists in europe from fifteen ninety to sixteen twenty six in the dedication of a song to my loving countryman mr john foster the younger merchant of dublin in ireland dowland sufficiently indicates his nationality and his compositions betray all the charm and grace of irish melody it is of interest to add that the earliest printed irish dance is in porthenia in violata of which work published in sixteen thirteen to fourteen there is only one copy known now in the new york public library from sixteen hundred to sixteen o two charles o'reilly was harpist to the court of denmark at two hundred dollars a year his successor was donald dope the black old cahill sixteen o two to sixteen ten who followed anne of denmark to the english court walter quinn of dublin was music master to king james eldest son prince henry from sixteen o eight to sixteen eleven other noted harpers of the first half of the seventeenth century are rory dahl the blind o'cahan 
nicholas dahl pierce tak mccrory john rory and henry scott owen mckeenan owen mcdermott tar o'coffey and father robert nugent s j darby scott was harper to the danish court from sixteen twenty one till his death at copenhagen on december nineteenth sixteen thirty four pierce ferreter a gentleman harper was executed at killarney in sixteen fifty two miles o'reilly and the two connellans were famous harpers between the years sixteen sixty and sixteen eighty evelyn the english diarist in sixteen sixty eight praises the excellent performances on the harp of sir edward sutton who in the following year was granted by king charles the second the lands of Conway, county kildare two beautiful harps of this period are still preserved the fitzgerald harp and the fogarty harp there are many exquisite airs of the seventeenth century some of which have been incorporated in moore's irish melodies the titles of several airs of this epoch are of historical interest e g sarsfield's lament lament for owen roe o'neill macallistrum's march net of the hill the breach of Ogram, limerick's lamentation lily berlero balena mona the boyne water and the wild geese irish tunes abound in the various editions of playford's country dances from sixteen fifty one to seventeen twenty turlock o'carolan sixteen seventy to seventeen thirty eight who has been styled the last of the irish bards wrote and composed innumerable songs also plexties claracas and lamentations it is here merely necessary to note that twenty-six of o'carolan's airs are included in moore's irish melodies although his claim to them has only recently been proved by the present writer goldsmith's eulogy of o'carolan is well known the jacobite period from seventeen ten to seventeen fifty considerably influenced irish minstrelsy and some of the most delightful airs were adapted to jacobite lyrics sigan budi an shan dwin lament for kilcatch armand's lament morin ni chilenen all the way to galway the air of yankee doodle caitlin ni hulahan balance a straw the wearing of the green st patrick's day plankin perby are amongst the tunes in vogue at this period as early as sixteen eighty five the hibernian catch club was established and still flourishes sicilian celebrations were held from seventeen twenty seven to seventeen thirty two and a dublin academy of music was founded in seventeen twenty eight the charitable and musical society founded in seventeen twenty three built the fishamble street music hall in seventeen forty one and assisted at the first performance of the messiah conducted by hondel himself on thirteenth april seventeen forty two kitty clive peg woffington and daniel sullivan were noted irish singers of this epoch while john clegg dr murphy and burke thomas were famous instrumentalists in seventeen forty one richard pokritch invented the musical glasses for which gluck wrote some pieces it was afterwards improved by benjamin franklin on the continent henry madden was music director of the chapel royal at versailles in seventeen forty four in succession to Canberra, and was also canon of st quentin in seventeen sixty four the earl of mornington muse d was appointed first professor of music in dublin university a few years later charles claggett invented the valve horn michael kelly of dublin was specially selected by mozart to create the parts of basilio and don curcio at the first performance of the opera of figaro on may first seventeen eighty six kane o'hara samuel lee owenson neil baron dillon dr doyle 
t a geary mao and the earl of westmeath were distinguished musicians while the fame of carter mountain moorhead and dr colgan was not confined to ireland among native minstrels jerome duganon dominic mongan dennis hemson charles byrne james duncan arthur victory and arthur o'neill were celebrated as harpers the belfast meeting of seventeen ninety two revived the vogue of the national instrument nor was the bagpipe neglected even in america in seventeen seventy eight lord rawdon had a band of pipers with barney thompson as pipe major at home sterling jackson macdonald moorhead kennedy and macklin sustained the reputation of this ancient instrument ere the close of the eighteenth century john field of dublin was a distinguished pianist he subsequently eighteen fourteen invented invented the nocturne developed by chopin sir john stevenson the arranger of the irish melodies tom cook william southwell inventor of the damper action for pianofortes henry mountain andrew ash flautist barton rook and bunting were world famed among the irish musicians of the last century the following names are typical thomas moore j a wade Bow, bohemian girl wallace maritana osborne sir frederick Osler, scutson clark howard glover corncastle j w glover sir robert stewart augusta holmes r m levy joseph robinson ford lover kearns allen barker torrance malloy guernsey gilmore thunder harvey goodman sir arthur sullivan pinafore mikado miss davis halliday inventor of the kent bugle latham dugan gaskin lacy pontet piccolomini hudson pickett Horan marx and w c levy famous vocalists like catherine hayes mrs scott fennel senior folly foley barton mcguckin dennis o'sullivan and william ludwig deserve inclusion in our own day it is only necessary to mention composers like sir charles villiers stanford dr c woods victor herbert mrs needham dr sinclair norman o'neill and arthur o'leary singers like egan burke plunkett green john mccormick p o'shea charles manners and joseph o'mara violinists like maud mccarthy emily key arthur darley and patrick delaney organists like dr charles marcham brendan rogers dr Chose, and professor buck writers like mrs Kerwin, dr annie patterson mrs milligan fox professor mahaffey a p graves dr collison and g b shaw and conductors like hamilton hardy and james glover references walker irish bards seventeen eighty six o'curry lectures eighteen seventy hardiman irish minstrelsy two volumes eighteen thirty four the complete petri collection three volumes nineteen o two to nineteen o four grattan flood history of irish music third edition nineteen thirteen story of the harp nineteen o six story of the bagpipe nineteen eleven mrs milligan fox annals of the irish harpers nineteen eleven mason song lore of ireland nineteen ten armstrong musical instruments two volumes nineteen o four to nineteen o eight o'neill irish folk music nineteen eleven irish minstrels and musicians nineteen thirteen end of section eight